Queens of Europe. Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary, Queen of Scots, ascended the throne at just six days old. She became Queen Consort of France at 16 and was widowed at 17. After returning to Scotland, she fell in lust with her handsome cousin. But the honeymoon ended abruptly when her new groom stabbed her friend 56 times in front of her. Mary probably had him strangled and then quickly married again to her second husband's murderer. But as they say, marry in haste, repent over the course of your 19-year imprisonment. Queen Mary then got herself entangled in plots to overthrow her lifelong rival, Queen Elizabeth I. But instead of wearing the English crown, Mary's head ended up on an English chopping block. Thank you to Acorn TV for sponsoring this video. Mary was born on December 8, 1542. Her father, King James V of Scotland, sired at least nine illegitimate children, but his first wife, Madeline of Valois, died of tuberculosis at 16. James had two sons with his second wife, French noblewoman Mary de Guise. When baby James was 10 months old and Arthur just eight days old, both boys died suddenly within 14 hours of each other, likely from illness. The king's mother, Margaret Tudor, died of a stroke later that same year. Without her encouraging peace, King James declared war on his English uncle, King Henry VIII, over old resentments and James's refusal to break with the Catholic Church. Within a year of her baby son's deaths, Queen Mary de Guise was again expecting. King James kissed his pregnant wife goodbye and rode south to attack England. After losing the Battle of Solway Moss, James suffered a nervous breakdown. Add to that a bout of dysentery he caught from drinking contaminated water on the battlefield, and the king was on his deathbed when he received the news of the birth of his third and only surviving legitimate child, a daughter, Mary. According to legend, James ruefully exclaimed, It came with a lass, and it will go with a lass referring to the beginnings of his Stuart dynasty when Marjorie Bruce, daughter of King Robert the Bruce, married Walter Stuart in 1314. King James died at the age of 30, leaving the crown of Scotland on the tiny head of his six-day-old daughter. Many feared that baby Mary would die, leaving Scotland to fall into chaos over who would wear the crown. But the English ambassador saw baby Mary unwrapped by her nurse and wrote, It is as goodly a child as I have seen of her age and likely to live. As healthy as she was, Mary was too young to rule a country. The next person in the line of succession, Mary's third cousin, the Earl of Arran, became her regent. When Mary was six months old, he signed the Treaty of Greenwich, agreeing that, in ten years' time, the baby queen would wed King Henry VIII's five-year-old son and heir, Prince Edward. The treaty stipulated that the long-time rival kingdoms of England and Scotland would remain legally separate, but united under the couple and their future children. Scottish Catholics rejected the treaty as they wanted to continue their long-standing partnership with Catholic France against England. Never one to be crossed, Henry VIII launched a military campaign called the Rough Wooing, designed to impose the marriage treaty on the Scots. With the English army closing in, Aaron made a desperate bid for French aid. King Henri II of France agreed to send his troops to beat the English back in exchange for a marriage treaty between the now four-year-old Queen Mary and his own three-year-old son and heir, Francois. The Scottish Parliament agreed to this treaty, deciding that their queen would be safer out of the country. At five, Mary was sent to Paris to be educated in preparation for her marriage and life as the future queen consort of France. The entourage that accompanied her included her governess and the four Marys, four girls of her own age, all named Mary, who came from the most powerful families in Scotland. Young Queen Mary was vivacious, beautiful, and clever. 
she was well-liked by everyone at the French court, with the exception of her future mother-in-law, Catherine de Medici. King Henri called her the most perfect child I have ever seen. She became close friends with her future sister-in-law, Elizabeth of Valois. Her French maternal grandmother, Antoinette du Bourbon, became a mother figure to her, as her own mother had remained behind in Scotland to secure her child's interests. Mary was the epitome of medieval female accomplishment. She played the lute and virginals, and enjoyed reading and writing prose and poetry. She was competent in horsemanship, falconry, and needlework, and spoke French, Italian, Latin, Spanish, and Greek, in addition to her native Scots. She had bright auburn hair, hazel eyes under heavy lids, a long, graceful neck, and finely arched brows. She contracted smallpox in her childhood, but was left unblemished by the disease that so often devastated. Mary was a pretty child and grew into a strikingly attractive woman, standing at 5 foot 11, well above most women and men of her time. Dauphin Francois was unusually short and spoke with a stammer, but the young fiancés got on well from the moment they met as children. They grew up together more like siblings than future spouses. But by 14 and 15, it was time for their relationship to change. Mary agreed to sign a secret document which, if she died childless, would hand Scotland and her claim to the English throne to France. Three weeks later, she wed Francois at Notre Dame de Paris, making him King Consort of Scotland. The teenage queen cut a striking figure in a wedding gown, white as a lily, and of which two young ladies carried a wonderfully long train. While she was living in France, Mary changed the spelling of the name of her dynasty from Stuart with an E-W to Stuart with a U-A to make it easier for the French to pronounce. Meanwhile in England, King Henry VIII's daughter, Queen Mary I, died leaving the throne to her younger sister, Elizabeth. As their father had broken with the Catholic Church to divorce Catherine of Aragon and marry Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn, Catholics saw Elizabeth as illegitimate. In their eyes, the English throne rightfully belonged to the next legitimate person in the line of succession, Margaret Tudor's granddaughter, Mary, Queen of Scots. King Henri declared his son and daughter-in-law King and Queen of England, but the titles were only theoretical. The following year, King Henri died after being impaled through the eye during a jousting accident, leaving the very real positions of King and Queen of France to 15 and 16-year-old Francois and Mary. Catherine de' Medici threw a coronation gala for the pair, which included the first fireworks display ever seen in France. The teenage couple reigned for 18 months, but Mary's maternal uncles, the Guise brothers, had a tight grip on the court and did most of the actual ruling. They terrorized the young royals into submission, meanwhile perpetrating a number of massacres on Protestant Huguenots, igniting the French Wars of Religion, which would burn the country for 30 years. King Francois died at the age of 16 of an ear infection that led to an abscess in his brain. Devastated, Mary dressed in white, the traditional mourning color in France. The young widow remained in France for nine months while the court waited to see if she was pregnant with the king. But as no baby appeared, Francois was succeeded by his 10-year-old brother, Charles IX. 18-year-old Mary returned to Scotland after living in France for 13 years. Her mother, Mary de Guise, had taken control of the regency from the Earl of Arran seven years earlier. She ruled on her daughter's behalf but died of dropsy, though some suspected poison the year before her offspring's homecoming. Queen Mary had no idea of the dangerous and complex political situation she was stepping into. Catholics and Protestants were at each other's throats. A devout Catholic, Mary was resented by her Protestant subjects for hearing mass, dancing, and dressing too elaborately. 
She tried to build cordiality with the head of the Protestant faction, her illegitimate half-brother, James Stuart, Earl of Moray, by making him her chief advisor and appointing a number of other Protestants to her privy council. But this infuriated the Catholic lairds, leaving the queen in a tenuous position. Rather than dealing with the problems in the country she did rule, Mary was focused on the country she might rule, England. She sent an ambassador to London to try and get Queen Elizabeth to officially name her heir presumptive. Though by the rules of primogeniture, the Scottish queen was next in line for the English throne, Elizabeth refused to make it official. It's no wonder Mary was keen to get her hands on England. The thriving wool trade was making the country rich and allowing art, music, and theater to flourish. Playwrights like William Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe were staging remarkable new plays. And that great tradition of British drama is carried on today on Acorn TV. Binge thousands of hours of British mysteries, dramas, comedies, and documentaries, commercial-free for only $5.99 a month. You can stream on the app and on dozens of devices. I've been catching up with my old favorites, including World War II female-driven drama Land Girls and documentaries about the Tudor kings and queens. And Acorn has a ton of exclusive originals, like Whitstable Pearl, a modern murder mystery set in an English seaside town. With Acorn TV, there's always something new to discover. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and using promo code Lindsay Holiday. That's capital L and all lowercase after that. And now, back to history. The strikingly beautiful young Queen of Scots next turned her attention to finding a new husband and securing her dynasty. Her French uncle, the Cardinal of Lorraine, one of the Guise brothers who had controlled and terrorized her during her time in France, began marriage negotiations with Archduke Charles of Austria behind Mary's back. Now out of his reach, she angrily objected to his attempts to control her from afar. Mary herself inquired about a match with Carlos, Prince of Asturias, son and heir to King Philip II of Spain. Philip was the widower of Mary's English cousin, Queen Mary I, and he was currently married to her childhood friend, Elizabeth of Valois. But the Spanish king rebuffed the Scottish queen's proposal. The rejection turned out to be lucky for Mary, as Don Carlos, the product of excessive inbreeding, was violently insane. His father was later forced to confine him, and he died at the age of 23. Queen Elizabeth wrote to her cousin to suggest she marry Elizabeth's own favorite, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. By this time, the English queen had made it public that she intended never to marry or bear children and to remain the virgin queen. She offered to make Mary her heir if she wed Dudley. But the Scottish queen was furious at her cousin's transparent attempts to control her and had no interest in marrying her ex-lover. Still single and thus by 16th century standards, vulnerable, Mary became the object of the harassment of Pierre de Chastelar, a French poet employed at her court. He was obsessed with the queen and was discovered by guards hiding under her bed, waiting to surprise her when she was alone and declare his love for her. Aghast, Mary banished him from Scotland. Two days later, Pierre walked through his exile and forced his way into Mary's bedchamber as she was getting undressed. She yelled out in fear and fury, and her half-brother, James Murray, rushed to help, and Pierre was restrained and arrested. He was found guilty of treason and beheaded. At 22, Mary danced a galliar with the dashingly handsome, six-foot-tall Henry Stuart Lord Darnley and she fell hard for him. The couple married at Holyrood Palace in July 1565. Mary and Darnley were first cousins. His mother, Lady Margaret Douglas, was the daughter of Margaret Tudor by her second marriage after the death of King James IV. 
Thus, both halves of the Scottish royal couple had firm claims on the English throne, and their children would have an even stronger combined claim. While the marriage was certainly politically convenient, Mary was quite bewitched by passion for Darnley. She proclaimed him the lustiest and best proportioned long man she had ever seen. And the English ambassador wrote back to his queen that the marriage could only be stopped by violence. Once the passion of the honeymoon was over, Mary saw clearly that Darnley was vain, arrogant, and unreliable. She had named him King Consort, but he wasn't satisfied. He demanded the crown matrimonial, which would have made him a co-sovereign with the right to keep the throne if Mary died. The queen refused and the marriage grew tense. Darnley had a violent streak exacerbated by drink in which he indulged frequently. Mary became pregnant, but the obvious strain in the royal marriage led to rumors that the child had been fathered by her private secretary and confidant, David Rizzio, an Italian Catholic. Darnley conspired with a handful of Protestant layers, and together they stabbed Rizzio 56 times at a dinner party in front of a horrified Mary. On June 19, 1566, Mary gave birth to her first child, a son. She named him James for her own father and the four kings of Scotland who had preceded him. The murder of Rizzio and the strain of her terrible marriage overwhelmed Mary. She was overcome by a serious but undefined illness, which included vomiting, loss of sight and speech, convulsions, and periods of unconsciousness. Many feared that the queen would die, leaving four-month-old James on the throne. But her French physician skillfully treated her, and she recovered her health. Mary then met with leading nobles to discuss the problem of Darnley. Divorce was considered, but everyone knew that Darnley was too arrogant to go quietly and that the safest option was to eliminate the king consort. Fearing for his life, Darnley fled court and headed for his father's estate in Glasgow. But while on the journey, he too became mysteriously ill. Possible diagnoses include smallpox, syphilis, or poisoning. He convalesced at the home of a friend on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Mary came to visit him every day, and it appeared the couple were reconciling. On February 9, 1567, Mary stopped to see her husband and then left to attend the wedding of a member of her household. In the wee hours of the morning, Darnley's bedroom exploded, but he wasn't in it. His body was found along with that of his servant, half naked, lying in a nearby orchard. They had been strangled or smothered. Queen Mary's council offered a generous reward for information about the conspirators who had assassinated the king consort. But suspicion soon fell on the queen herself, as well as on James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell. Darnley's father, the Earl of Lennox, demanded that Bothwell be tried for murder, and the Queen agreed. But while Lennox was away gathering evidence, Mary ordered the trial to go ahead without him. With no evidence presented against him, Bothwell was acquitted after a brief seven-hour trial. Off the hook for regicide, he divorced his wife and gathered support from two dozen Protestant lairds for his plan to marry the queen by any means necessary. Queen Mary went to visit her 10-month-old son at his household in Stirling. It would be the last time she would ever see her son. On her ride home, Bothwell abducted her and possibly raped her. Whether or not she was a willing participant remains a mystery. The pair were married in a Protestant service on May 13th, just three months after Darnley's death. Suspicions about her second husband's demise quickly turned into outrage over her hasty third marriage. Catholics refused to recognize Bothwell's divorce or the Protestant marriage service and the Protestants resented one of their own being raised above them. 
26 lairds banded together and raised an army to oppose Marion Bothwell. They squared up with the Queen's army at Carberry Hill, but no battle took place. While the two sides were busy negotiating, most of Mary's men deserted her. With no army to defend her, the Queen was taken into custody and returned to Edinburgh, where crowds jeered her as an adulteress and murderer. While imprisoned, Mary miscarried twins. As soon as she was well enough to get out of bed, she was forced to sign papers of abdication, handing the throne over to her one-year-old son, James, and making her brother, James Murray, his regent. Bothwell was driven into exile. He sailed towards Denmark, where he hoped to gain the support of King Frederick II and raise an army to win back the throne for Mary. But a storm forced him to land in Bergen, Norway instead. This just happened to be the birthplace of his first wife, Anna Throndersen. Her powerful family arrested Bothwell for spousal abandonment and for keeping Anna's dowry. Bothwell spent the next 11 years chained to a pillar. He died insane at the age of 44. His mummified body showed up in the Edinburgh Wax Museum in 1976. After a year in prison, Mary was aided to escape by her jailers. The former queen fled south, reaching England in a fishing boat. She was confident that her cousin, Elizabeth, would help her regain her throne, but she was mistaken. Once she reached England, she was taken into custody. As an anointed queen, Mary refused to recognize the power of any court to try her, and she did not show up to her trial. Moray, also on trial for overthrowing the queen, presented the so-called casket letters as evidence against Mary. These eight unsigned love letters, purportedly from Mary to Bothwell, were found in a small silver casket decorated with the monogram of King Francois II. The messages appear to confirm Mary's guilt, but she insisted that they were forgeries, and their authenticity remains a mystery to this day. In the end, no one was found guilty. Elizabeth couldn't very well convict a fellow queen, but she wanted a Protestant regime that she could influence in Scotland. So she allowed Moray to return as regent, and she kept Mary in prison. Though under guard and confined to a number of different castles, Mary wasn't roughing it. She had a household staff of at least 16 servants, including chefs who served her nightly feasts of 32 dishes on silver plate. She needed 30 carts to transport her wardrobe, tapestries, and household goods to the spa town of Buxton every summer. The former queen spent much of her time doing embroidery. But due to porphyria, or merely lack of exercise, her health began to decline, and by her 40s, she was rendered lame by severe rheumatism. While Mary was locked away, the drama continued beyond the castle walls. Moray was assassinated, and Scotland broke into civil war, Catholics against Protestants. Meanwhile, Queen Elizabeth vacillated on what to do about her captive cousin. Mary's claim to the English throne made her a focal point for Catholics who plotted to replace the Protestant Queen of England. The Duke of Norfolk plotted to raise Spanish troops to take the English throne for Mary, who he, of course, planned to wed. Norfolk was beheaded in the Tower of London. Another plot, endorsed by the Pope, planned to wed Mary to John of Austria, governor of the Netherlands, in exchange for Dutch troops to win her the throne. Mary wrote to Elizabeth and her son James, now 18 and ruling Scotland on his own. She offered to relinquish her claim on both of their thrones in exchange for her freedom. But neither Elizabeth nor James trusted Mary. Instead, they signed an alliance between themselves and left Mary in prison. In 1586, Mary was set up by Elizabeth's spymaster, Francis Walsingham. He arranged for letters to be smuggled to and from Mary. Little did she know that Walsingham was reading every word. 
once he intercepted a message in which Mary consented to the assassination of the English queen and the invasion of England by Spanish and French troops, he knew he had her. Mary was put on trial for treason. She denied the charges and protested that as a foreign anointed queen, she had never been an English subject and thus could not be convicted of treason. But convicted she was and sentenced to death. Elizabeth, wary of further angering the many Catholic monarchs already against her and of setting the precedent that one monarch had the legal right to execute another, dithered about signing the death warrant. She inquired of Mary's jailer if he might find some way to shorten the life of her cousin, but he refused to make a shipwreck of his conscience. Finally, under pressure from Parliament, Elizabeth signed Mary's death warrant. On February 7, 1587, Mary was told that she would be beheaded the next morning. She spent her final hours praying, writing her will, and giving away her possessions to members of her household. She was being held at Fotheringhay Castle, and a scaffold was erected in the Great Hall and draped in black cloth. When the executioner knelt before her to ask her forgiveness, she replied, I forgive you with all my heart, for now I hope you shall make an end of all my troubles. Her servants removed her black cloak, revealing a velvet petticoat and pair of sleeves in crimson, the color of Catholic martyrdom. They tied a gold embroidered white blindfold over her eyes and helped her to kneel on a cushion and lay her head down on the block. The queen exclaimed, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit, and stretched out her arms, ready for the axe to strike. The inexperienced executioner missed and struck Queen Mary in the back of her head. His second blow severed her neck, but left a bit of sinew, which he sawed apart with the axe. After this barbarous butchery, he grabbed the former queen's severed head by her hair and held it aloft, declaring, God save Queen Elizabeth. But Mary's head fell free as her auburn tresses had actually been a wig. The already reeling witnesses were shocked that Mary's once beautiful locks were now short and gray. One witness wrote that Queen Mary's lips continued to move for a quarter of an hour after her head was separated from her body, and that her small pet dog, who had been hiding under her skirt, ran free amid the chaos. Mary's clothes, the block, and everything touched by her blood were burned to deter relic hunters. When Queen Elizabeth was informed that her cousin was dead, she was indignant and claimed that she hadn't meant for the death warrant she had signed to be executed. She had the counselor who had arranged the execution arrested and imprisoned for two years. She denied Mary's request to be buried in France, the place she had spent the happiest years of her life. Instead, the Queen of Scots was embalmed, given a Protestant funeral, and buried at Peterborough Cathedral. Sixteen years later, Queen Elizabeth died. As she had no children, she left the English throne to her cousin, Mary's only son, King James VI of Scotland. He became King James I and VI of England and Scotland, uniting the longtime rival kingdoms and bringing the entire island of Britannia under one monarch. King James had his mother's body exhumed and reburied under a beautifully carved tomb in Westminster Abbey, next to the remains of Queen Elizabeth and the other great monarchs of England. Though Mary, Queen of Scots, made many mistakes, she did not bring about the end of the Stuart dynasty, as her father had predicted. With the exception of a slight beheading, the Stuart dynasty reigned over Scotland and England for another century, finally coming to an end with the death of a different lass, Queen Anne in 1714. 
If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.